starring Franco Tone in Venture in Silk Hat on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. But first, here is Gain Whitman. Decorators and homemakers tell us that soft-toned pastel walls are the style these days. And they're practical as well as beautiful. Interior walls that are dark and dingy detract from the appearance of a room and absorb the light. For a more modern home, use DuPont Speed Easy Wall Finish. Speed Easy is a resin oil emulsion paint that you thin with water. It is easy to apply to almost any interior wall surface, and it dries in less than one hour to a beautiful, rich, oil-type finish. Best of all, it costs less than $3 to redecorate the average room in one color. Speed Easy is one of DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Company presents Venture in Silk Hat, starring Franco Tone as James J. Andrews on The Cavalcade of America. James J. Andrews joined the Union Army soon after the outbreak of the Civil War, not as a soldier, but as an undercover agent. During the second year of the war, the 33-year-old West Virginian became the leader of one of the most daring secret missions of the Civil War, the Andrews Raid. Monday, April 7th, 1862. A murky, quiet day. There is a storm in the air. The soldiers of the 2nd Ohio Infantry encamped outside Shelbyville, Tennessee, are quiet but restless. Rumors of impending action ripple along the tented streets. In the quarters of General O.M. Mitchell, a tall civilian holding his high silk hat respectfully on his left arm, bends over the general's map table, and with a slender finger, he describes a circle of operation centering at Chattanooga, Tennessee. General Mitchell, if you should march from your present position here at Shelbyville, south to Huntsville, Alabama and then detach a force and send them eastward to drive General Beauregard's Confederates from Chattanooga, East Tennessee would be liberated. Mr. Andrews, that's a project near and dear to the heart of Mr. Lincoln. But what if Confederate forces south of Chattanooga? Wouldn't they come up and envelop us? Well, given a few hand-picked men, I could burn the bridges along the railroad from Marietta, Georgia, north to Chattanooga. General Beauregard's Confederates would be deprived of their only railroad to bring up reserves and supplies. If you can accomplish that, Mr. Andrews, we could take Chattanooga with little or no bloodshed. In fact, it might shorten this war immeasurably. Well, I'd need at least six men, sir. And the failure of your last mission might have been avoided if you had been given more support. This time, you'll have 24 hand-picked men. Thank you, sir. Then if we're to seize a locomotive, I'll need a train crew, several engineers and firemen all of whom can pass readily for Southerners. Very well, Mr. Andrews. You'll advise them that this will be a dangerous mission behind enemy lines, that they'll be in civilian clothes and subject to execution in the event of capture. I will explain the hazard, sir, and the penalty of failure. Mr. Andrews, this time there must be no failure. <laughs> look like the place, Sergeant? I don't think so, Ross. Andrews told me we'd come to a big clearing first, then a clump of trees. Yeah, that thunder sounds like we're in for some rain. A buddy of mine in camp says we're fools for going out with Andrews. He was with him on his last raid. How'd they come out? They failed. However, by the grace of God, most of them returned safely. They, uh, hang spies, don't they, Mr. Pittenger? Yes, I'm afraid so. Mm-hmm. The minute we're through the Confederate lines in these civilian clothes... We are spies. Yeah, spies. Mr. Andrews is a striking figure in that high silk hat, frock coat and gray striped trousers. Hey, he looks more like a poet than a fighting man. Well, nonetheless, he is a God-fearing man. There's something about him I like. His eyes, maybe. In spite of his previous failure, I have confidence in him. Oh, there's the clump of trees in the ravine beyond. Yeah, that's it, all right. From the look of things, we're just in time. There's Andrews standing by the lantern. Uh, Mr. Andrews, Pittenger reporting with Ross and Knight. Second Ohio volunteer, sir. Come closer, right. men, and be recognized. Yeah. Ross, sir. Right. Nice, sir. All right, men. All right. Well, we're all here now. When you volunteered for this duty, you didn't know exactly what it was. I want you to know it's dangerous, and there's every chance you may not come back alive. If there's any one of you who wishes to return to camp now, speak up and clear out. 
Thank you. I'm glad you'll all be with me. Men, our destination is Marietta, Georgia. Marietta? Well, that's 150 miles south of the Rebel line. We break up into twos and threes and travel by different routes. You've been furnished with enough money. Uh, Mr. Andrews, what if we're arrested? Yeah. Well, I hope that won't happen. But if it does, maybe I'll have enough influence to get you released. You see, gentlemen, I have spent considerable time in the South, establishing myself as a dispenser of quinine and other medicines to the Southern gentry. <laughs> uh, Mr. Andrews, what do we say if they ask us who we are and where we're heading? Well, tell them you're Kentuckians heading south to join some Confederate regiment. Now then, all you men should start talking as much like Southerners as you possibly can. I ain't got no Southern accent. Well, perhaps you'd better travel with me, Ross. I'll pass you off as my deaf and dumb brother. He's dumb, all right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Andrews, just what is the nature of our mission? For purposes of security, I cannot give you the details until we rendezvous at Marietta, George, on Thursday. We must be ready to strike on the morning of Friday the 11th. That's all for now, gentlemen. Don't forget, we meet on Thursday at the Railroad Hotel in Marietta. Good luck, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Seven o'clock. Still no sign of them. Here it is Saturday, with a day late getting started and five men still missing. You suppose the Confederates caught him? It's quite likely. We can't afford to delay any longer. By now, General Mitchell's forces will be in Huntsville. Well, this downpour must certainly have delayed our troops. Possibly. However, there are 20 of us, enough to see this thing through. How are we going to seize that train at Big Shanty Station? When we come by there last night, the Rebs had a camp there a mile wide. Mr. Andrews, wouldn't our chances of success be greater if we commandeer the train at some point closer to Chattanooga? That would limit our opportunities. There are 16 wooden bridges between here and Chattanooga, and I'd like to burn them all. Oh, my gosh, that's a wonderful... All right, men, we can wait no longer. You have your instructions. Get your tickets, board the northbound train quietly, and when the passengers and crews stop it for breakfast at Big Shanty Station... We'll seize the locomotive and a few cars and make for Chattanooga, destroying every bridge in our path. That's a mighty big order for 20 men, Mr. Andrews. Very true. But, gentlemen, if we accomplish our aim, the war will be shortened by many months, and countless lives will be spared. <laughs> That uh, train conductor is sizing up everybody very suspicious like. That's part of his job. He's on the lookout for southern conscripts running away from their army. Sort of young for a railroad conductor, ain't he? He's 26. Been with the railroad seven years. Oh. His name's William Fuller. Now a captain in the rebel army on railroad duty. Tickets, please. Here he comes. Don't speak unless you're obliged to. You don't like my southern accent? No. All tickets, please. All tickets. Well, Mr. Andrews. How do you do, Captain Fuller? Glad to see you again. My ticket, sir. Thank you, sir. Chattanooga. Did you know that Mitchell and his Yankees are headed that way? Is that so? Well, I don't expect to be there long enough to get tangled with them, Captain. Well, tell me, sir, will we have time to take breakfast at Big Shanty? Twenty minutes, sir. Thank you. Now then, you, sir, your ticket. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chattanooga also, huh? Do you mind showing me your credentials? Uh, well, uh, uh you I see... can vouch for this young man, Captain. My partner in the quinine business, Mr. Blake. Mr. Blake? Where are you from, sir? Uh... Mr. Blake is uh, slightly deaf, sir. That's why he's not in uniform. I see. Excuse me for bothering you. Got to be on the lookout for deserters. See you later, gentlemen. Tickets. Tickets, please. Phew. Not so loud, Ross. Are you nervous? <sighs> Paralyzed. I, I, I got a feeling he doesn't believe you. Stop worrying. Now, listen carefully. Knight and I will take over the engine as soon as Fuller and his crew go for breakfast. You board the engine with us as firemen. Pittenger will get the rest of our men into the boxcars and we'll uncouple the passenger section. You understand? Yes, sir. I understand. Big Shanty, all out for 20 minutes for breakfast at Miss Lace's boarding house across from the depot. This is it, Ross. Are you ready, Chief? All set, Mr. Knight. Well, men, shall we uh, go and have ourselves a little uh, breakfast? Goodness gracious sakes alive! You're on time this morning, Captain Fuller. Yes, sir, Miss Lacey. The General is the fastest locomotive on the road. Eight miles from Marietta in less than 20 minutes. My 
stars. That engine deal of yours is burning up the rails. How fast is that, Miss Murphy? Mighty fast, ma'am. Now under 25 miles an hour. Land sake. What is this world a coming to? How's business, Miss Lacey? With an army camp across the tracks, you need to ask? I don't mind them soldier boys eating us plumb out of house and home. But I wish they'd stop hanging around my daughter. <laughs> they get a little work out of them girls. All they do is tramp and fuss. Lucy! Stop your gambling with that soldier man and fetch the ham and me for our customers. Will you have gravy on your grits, Captain Fuller? Yes, sir. Murphy, that's our train starting. Yeah, it's a general. Captain Fuller, Miss Murphy, deserters are running off of your train. That was a neat getaway, Mr. Andrews. Oh, we took it right from under the nose of that Confederate sentry. Ran it right through a whole blamed army camp. <laughs> <laughs> so far, so good, men. But remember, we've over 150 miles to go with much work to do. Hey, look behind, Mr. Andrews. Captain Fuller and his engineer are chasing us on foot. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly put one over on Mr. Fuller. Hey, why the whistle, Knight? Curve ahead. Might be a southbound train on this line. Can't be too careful, you know, on a one-track railroad. We'll have to get hold of a timetable someplace. Hey, any tools on this train? Not a thing for tearing up track. What are we making now, Mr. Knight? About 20 miles an hour. No load or nothing to hold us back. Oh, they'll never catch us now. Men up ahead. Looks like a section gang. Section gang? Knight, get ready to stop. We need tools. Yes, sir. And Ross, keep an eye on Fuller. Oh, he's better than a mile back by now and still legging it, I'll bet. <laughs> I wonder what rank the captain will hold when this little episode is over. We'll have to take on water at Cass Station. Hey, Scott, as soon as we stop, drop off the train on the side away from this section crew and cut the telegraph line. Yes, sir. Hey there, you men. What's on your mind, Captain Fuller? Hey, you're a stranger. I ain't never seen you before. There's a lot of people you haven't seen. We're running this special through with supplies for General Beauregard. Chattanooga's being threatened by the Yankees. We want those tools you're using. Well, you want a railroad, too. Well, in case them Yankee patrols tear up the rails, we got to repair them ourselves. Pass them back to our work crew in the boxcars. Hurry, men. There's no time to lose. Right. We'll put them in the boxcar for you. Come on, Tom. Good going, Mr. Andrews. Did Scott take care of the telegraph? He <laughs> shinnied up that pole like a monkey on a stick. Here he comes. Tools are all loaded. Good, then. Let's be off. Thanks a lot, boys. You have no idea what you've done for the Confederacy. Hey. Hey, look back there. Here comes Captain Fuller, still on the run. I must say he's got a determination about him. And a very hot collar, I'll bet. You don't suppose Captain Fuller and these hounds expect to catch an old fox like Mr. Andrews? Not in a million years. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to French Tone as Secret Agent James J. Andrews in Venture in Silk Hat on the Cavalcade of America, presented by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. Operative Andrews and his Union Raiders have stolen a locomotive from Captain Fuller of the Confederate Army. As our story continues, Captain Fuller, determined to regain his stolen locomotive, Runs up to the section crew. Hey there! Look, it's come full of running like old get out. Mr. Murphy. Hey, what the hurry, fellas? Hey there. Uh, have you got a push car? You bet we have, sir. Then get it on the tracks. A bunch of deserters have run off with our train. Deserters? Well, I declare. Hey, Fuller, they cut the telegraph line. Murphy, this isn't the work of deserters. They must be Yankee spies. Huh? Get that push car on the track and let's be after them. I'll catch those Yankees if it's the last thing I do. Hey, Mr. Andrews, there's an old freight engine up ahead on the turntable. Let's stop and put it out of commission. No, no time for that. We're going to burn the bridge over the Etowah River. What, in this cloudburst? I'm telling you, mister, she'll never catch. Ram down the Johnson bar, Mr. Knight. Full steam ahead. Can't you fellows push a little faster? Hey, it's uphill, Captain. Hey, look, 
The old Yola sitting on the turntable. Yeah, with the steam up. Come on, boys. We'll spin that turntable around and be after him. Oh, we'll never catch a general with an old freight engine. It's easier and faster than pulling this car. Let's go, boys. I won't have them Yankees laughing up their sleeves at me. <laughs> Now, we don't dare stop long here, men. While I'm talking the station agent out of a timetable, water up the engine and take on some fuel. Okay, Mr. Andrews. Hey, you got the general out. Why is the rating the crew? My name's Andrews, sir. This uh, is a special section. Fuller's coming along in a few minutes with the passenger section. Funny, I didn't get no word about it. Well, everything's mixed up now with General Mitchell and his Yankees running wild. We're hustling powder and ball through to General Beauregard. Got to save Chattanooga from the Yankees. I hope you make it. Mighty dangerous running with all these extra trains on the road. Extra trains? Yep. Since them Yankees got to Huntsville, Bogart's been evacuating supplies and freight from Chattanooga. Say, do you have a schedule of these extra trains? Sure, right here. But it won't do you much good, though. There's so many specials are bobbing along the road every hour or so. What a way to run a railroad. Well, we'll have to take a chance. Thanks for the schedule. Don't mention it. Hurry it up, boys. Get that fuel loaded. We don't want to keep General Beauregard waiting. Well, that agent back at Cass Station was sure right about extra trains. Been waiting here at Kingston Siding for almost an hour now. Uh, one freight wouldn't have been so bad, but now a second one. If Fuller's still chasing us, this is his big chance. We've been riding now for six hours, and all we've done is cut a telegraph line in two places and pile some ties across the track. Well, I never dreamed of such ill luck. If only we'd been able to make this run yesterday when it was dry. Well, I told you that he tow a bridge had never burn in all this rain. Here comes the second freight. Well, get ready to move, Mr. Knight. Okay. And don't spare the steam. <laughs> Right, you men. Pile out of that boxcar and get busy tearing up this track. Yeah, about time we do something. Yeah, come on, let's go. Come on. Pittenger, get busy, remove those rails. Yes, sir. Scott, cut the telegraph line again and hurry. Every minute counts. Come on, give me a hand on the crowbar. We'll use it as a spike puller. Hey, the rest of you men load that wood in the rear car. Yeah. There's one spike out. Here, you men, get hold of this bar. We'll pry up the rail and the spikes will come with it. All together now. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That does it. Now let's get on the other rail. Hey, there's another train coming. That came from the south. It's Fuller. I'm afraid you're right. Let's go, man. Scott, the telegraph line taken care of. You bet, Mr. Then we're off. That track will stop him for a while. Let her go, Mr. Knight. Full steam. <laughs> Look up ahead. There's a break in the track. Stop the engine, Joe. Stop it quick. The Yankees have tore up the track. Yeah, it's a break in the track, all right. Now what are we going to do? Start using our legs again. There's a southbound freight due along here in 20 minutes. I'll stop that. We'll shove the cars into a side and uncouple the engine and go after them again. They won't get away. But you have to go in reverse. There's no turntable around here. That's all right. We'll go in reverse, but we'll catch them. Come on. Ross, keep your eye on that smoke behind us. They must have got hold of another engine. I've never seen such luck as them southerners are having. Uh, Fuller's not as big a fool as we thought. Knight, what's our speed? Oh, we're slowing a bit. Need more water. He stopped three hours ago. What's the matter with his engine? Nothing. No engine will run full speed forever without water. Fuller's gaining on a steady. Mr. Andrews, there's one way to stop Fuller. How's that, Knight? Tunnel Hill's ahead. We can leave our engine inside the tunnel. That'd sure stop him. Well, what about the bridges we're supposed to burn? We gotta think of our lives. They're gaining on us. Speed's dropping, Mr. Andrews. What about it? Don't you think we ought to leave the engine? We've a job to do. The covered bridge over the Chickamauga's just beyond the tunnel. We'll be able to get there, won't we? I think so. Fine. Ross, work your way back to the last boxcar and set fire to it. There's some oil there. Rip the car apart. Spread the oil. Get a good blaze going. 
We'll leave that car on the Chickamauga Bridge. That'll stop Fuller, and it'll finish that bridge, too. Get going. Oh, we're just wasting time standing here on the hill waiting for that bridge to burn. Hey, look. Here comes Fuller's train. Is the bridge on fire yet, Mr. Andrews? There's smoke coming from both ends. Hey, Ross, was that car blazing good when you uncoupled it? Oh, good as you could expect. The rain had soaked right through it. It's got to burn. It's got to burn. They're slowing up. They're slowing. Yeah, but look. They're going right on over the bridge. Oh, this will be the end of Captain Fuller. Now, that man has courage, but he'll never make it. Look. Look there. Hey, he's pushing the burning car out. The bridge didn't burn. We'll still give him a run for it. Let's go, Knight. gaining on us all the time, Andrew. I can see, Ross. Knight, what's the matter? Running out of water, sir. Slower all the time. What's wrong now? Pressure's dropping fast. Now we're all out of wood. Hey, wouldn't you think they'd have to stop for water and wood, too? Uh, they're in luck. I'm afraid we're not. We're running out of steam. It's no use. Stop the engine, Knight. Maybe we can ambush him. Ross, get back to the boxcars. Tell the men to scatter. Sorry, boys. It looks like this is the end of the line. Well, we've reached the end of the line, all right. The Chattanooga jail. Yeah. The end of our line will be a rope's end when the court-martials are done. We accepted the hazards when we signed with Andrews for the rain. The rain delayed us one day, or we might well have succeeded. Yeah, it wasn't only the rain. It was that conductor, Captain Fuller. If it hadn't been for him, we would have made it. And he's the guy we laughed at. Well, I don't know where he is now, but he's better off than we are. That guy sure had a determination. Gentlemen of the Georgia Legislature... It is my honor today as governor of this state to present to you your fellow Georgian, Captain William A. Fuller, the man who has successfully foiled one of our enemy's most audacious attempts to bring destruction upon our forces, the man to whom the armies of East Tennessee and Virginia owe their very existence. I wonder how long we're going to sit in this prison. Listen a minute. They're bringing Andrews back from the judge advocate's office. Yeah, it's the end of the line, all right. I can tell by the way he walks. He's still wearing that silk hat. All right, you men. Stand back from the door. All right, get in there, Andrews. Is there anything I can do for you, Mr. Andrews? No, no. No, I think not, didn't you? Perhaps... Perhaps you'd like to read from my Bible. Thank you, Victor. I know how you men must feel. I only hope you realize that I did the best I could. No man can do more. I appreciate your consolation, didn't you? But I have failed. Twice I have failed my country. Perhaps someday this nation will find a way to unite again. United to go on for tomorrow. My hope now is that you men shall be spared, that I may pay for my failure by walking to the gallows alone. Be not afraid. I'm not afraid. It isn't death a man fears. It's the realization that he dies of failure. <laughs> President, as Judge Advocate General of the U.S. Army, I recommend on the basis of the report herewith submitted that the Congressional Medal of Honor or suitable equivalent be bestowed upon the aforementioned James J. Andrews, faithful and courageous secret agent of this government. The award must regrettably be posthumously bestowed, for Andrews lost his life in this mission, captured and executed with seven of his band by the enemy, according to the rights of war in Atlanta, Georgia, on June 7th, 1862.
star, Francho Tone, will return to our cavalcade microphone in a moment. Now, here is Gaines Whitman. The first public showings of high-frequency television in color have just been announced. There are other signs that television is at last on its way to you. Basketball games, hockey, prize fights, and other sporting events are all being televised this winter on regular schedules. One reason television has been delayed is that the war called for the production of radar rather than television sets. Another reason is that the picture, the image seen at the receiving end, was small. This has been taken care of now. Television pictures can be five times the size they used to be, big enough to fill a home movie screen. They are magnified with the aid of a plastic lens. A few years ago, the lens would have been too expensive because it would have been necessary to grind it from optical glass. Now it is simply and economically made of DuPont Lucite Methyl Methacrylate Resin, which is crystal clear. Another plastic that will help to bring you better television when the new receivers reach the market is polythene. Discovered in England and developed in the United States by DuPont, polythene, a lightweight plastic, so light it floats on water, is an unusually good insulator for the kind of high-frequency electricity used in television. When the Army-Navy football game was televised for the first time this past November, it was picked up in Philadelphia and relayed to New York and Schenectady over coaxial cables insulated with polythene. Television stations are built by electrical and mechanical engineers, but there are no hard and fast boundaries in science. Just as physicists and engineers help us greatly with chemistry at the DuPont Company, so the chemist helps other scientists in the field of electronics. Scientific interdependence, mutual helpfulness, is graphically illustrated by television's use of lenses of lucite and polythene insulation, both of which are DuPont better things for better living through chemistry. And now, here is Pancho Tone. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the March of Dimes began today. You and I are given the privilege of contributing and lending our support to the Infantile Paralysis Fund. I hope you'll remember to send your dime. It's a good way to help in the fight being waged every day around the clock against this terrible wasting disease. Send your dimes and dollars to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Do it tonight. Thank you. Next week... Cavalcade will tell the hilarious story of what happened when the U.S. War Department decided to buy some camels for experimental use on the plains of Texas at the 4th Cavalry Base back in the 1850s. When the unsightly beasts got mixed up with a local pageant, a beautiful girl, and an attack by Comanche Indians, the Cavalry Base was rocked to its foundations. Our stars will be Joel McRae and Lorraine Day when Cavalcade presents The Camels Are Coming. Music for tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. Franco Tone may be currently seen in the Universal Picture because of him. Our Cavalcade play was written by Norris Houghton and was based on the book Railroad Avenue by Freeman H. Hubbard. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to Joel McRae and Lorraine Day in The Camels Are Coming on The Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.